Welcome everyone. I, um, my clock's showing one o'clock, so I think we can go ahead and get started as more people continue to join us. Before the session starts, I have a statement to read on behalf of the conference. The Open Education Southern Symposium strives to offer an open, inclusive, and friendly environment for all participants. All attendees are expected to help maintain a professional and welcoming environment free of any type of harassment by being mindful of the space and time you are taking up, being aware of the dynamics of power and privilege, being considerate of others' desire for privacy, being respectful of others and accepting the differences in opinions and circumstances create a stronger collaborative environment and actively challenging individual biases and assumptions. Samantha, you can go ahead and start your presentation and I'll put the full code of conduct and reporting form in the chat. Okay, great, thank you. So today's presentation, a short presentation, is on accessible OER materials, creating more inclusive learning materials with Universal Design for Learning, UDL, for the Open Education Southern Symposium in July 2021. So welcome. So my name is Sam Harlow. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the online learning librarian within research, outreach, and instruction, as well as a liaison librarian to some health science uh, areas at UNC Greensboro. We're right in the middle of North Carolina. And I work on OER initiatives and programs with my colleague, uh, Melody Rood, who's our student success librarian. So today I'm gonna be talking about um, mostly UDL connecting to OER, and it's a lot of acronyms thrown out there throughout the presentation. So we'll start with the definition and the core concepts of universal design for learning, otherwise referred to as UDL. We're gonna make a connection between OER and UDL, um, Open Educational Resources, and we're gonna be doing um, universal design for learning and equity, diversity, and inclusion, sometimes referred to as EDI, connecting the dots between the two. And then we're gonna be wrapping up um, by having time for Mama. questions. Sorry, I have a three-year-old here. Go downstairs, Mama. go downstairs, Mama. please. Sorry, she's here, we'll, we'll just power through. Um, so this is a link to follow along with our stuff. So here you go. Did you snap my stuff? Go downstairs. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so there's a link to the presentation. She was informed that I have this presentation. So we're going to start with a quick poll. Um, and this is a short presentation. So um, that um, link has uh, a lot of hyperlinks throughout the presentation if you want to learn more about UDL and OER. So we're going to start with a quick um, Mentimeter, which I'm going to drop in the chat. We're probably all um, pretty familiar with that. Um, all panelists and attendees. So if you just want to click out into that, it just asks a couple questions about your level of familiar, familiarity with OER and UD, or with UDL. Um, so it should just take a couple minutes. It's a scale question. And then just what we want to learn today. I just want to make sure we're covering um, as much as possible. Okay, um, a couple of you are like in the middle of like an expert on universal design for learning. Um, a lot of you create online learning objects as a part of your job. Great, we're going to talk about um, how we can use it to create online learning objects as well as in our teaching um, and practice. And uh, a lot of you all are in the middle in terms of accessibility. And we're going to talk about the intersection between all of those things. So the next question is just quick in that, what are you hoping to learn today in this short presentation on um, OER um, and universal design for learning? And it could be like, you know, I'm just here for fun. Um, I'm already an expert and just looking for practical tips, um, whatever you want. So tips, tricks, and ideas. So we're gonna talk about practical applications of UDL and OER and the intersections. Um, practical good, we're gonna be covering practical. We also are gonna be pushing it a little bit further into like, you know, how can we go beyond universal 
universal design for learning and uh, do inclusive design, easing the process of including accessibility tools. Cool, yes. Great, and we do have um, in, through, again, the link for the presentation does include a lot of links out to these practical tips to further reading and more because again, this is a short presentation. Great. Okay. And there will be time at the end too, if we wanna do any sharing of practical tips too. So again, um, we're gonna cover this pretty quickly because again, a lot of y'all said you're kind of already familiar with the basics of universal design for learning, otherwise referred to as UDL. So um, this link here goes out to CAST, um, which is a great resource to learn more about universal design for learning, but it is a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how humans learn. So what does that mean? It means that UDL is asking us to create in our teaching or in our online learning objects, multiple forms of engagement, representation and action and expression. So specifically what we mean by that is we want engagement to stimulate interest and motivation for learning. We want representation to be uh, to present information and content in different ways. And we want action and expression to differentiate the ways that students can express what they know. And again, this includes, inclu this includes having multiple forms of each of these elements. So when we talk about universal design for learning, what we're really talking about is breaking down barriers for students, which of course includes accessibility, which we're gonna talk about in a second. So really we're, when we talk about it, you know, sometimes people refer to it as equality, but really equality is providing equal things to different learners, which as you can see from this graphic over here on the far left, doesn't work well. But then with equity, we're providing different things to different learners to get them where they need to be to be able to access learning environments, right? That's kind of the basics of accessibility. But what, liber what UDL is requesting is that we're really breaking down barriers like knocking down that fence to, to get our students into a state of liberation or our patrons or faculty, right, where there's no barriers at all. And that's the kind of learning environments that UDL is trying to create, whether it is, again, synchronous or asynchronous environments. So UDL, um, including CAST, the um, resource that I was mentioning before that has a lot of information on universal design for learning, has something called the UDL Guidelines. So a lot of y'all in the Mentimeter poll at the beginning, we're talking about practical tips for universal design, for accessibility. And here's where we're at with the, universe, the UDL guidelines. They're a tool used in the implementation of UDL, and they offer a set of concrete suggestions that can be applied to any discipline or domain to ensure that all learners can access and participate in meaningful, challenging learning opportunities. So if you follow this link out, it takes you to a rubric type of, um, of graphic image text that um, is has different checkpoints to kind of engage us and how we can do better in terms of providing multiple means of engagement, um, representation, action and expression. So for example, if I was like, I want to do better providing multiple means of engagement, I could look and see what I could do with recruiting interest, sustaining effort and persistence and self-regulation. And then you can click into the different checkpoints, like here I'll cl click into foster collaboration and community, and it gives you a definition of what they mean, as well as concrete practical examples of what we can do in our, with our online learning objects, with our design and with our teaching to be able to hit this checkpoint to do better with our universal design for learning. So here you can see you can create expectations for group works by including rubrics and norms. You can create cooperative learning groups with clear goals, roles and responsibilities. So again, it's a really, again, practical, concrete thing. So if you haven't checked this out, but you are kind of familiar with UDS, I highly recommend it to kind of uh, get into that design mindset of UDL in that way. So um, when UDL is talked about, and y'all mentioned this in the poll, it's usually talked about when talking about accessibility. So we've already defined UDL, but the definition of accessibility is the, rest, is the quality of being able to be reached or entered. And accessibility is usually talked about and framed around talking about differently abled or disabled patrons, students, um, people using our materials. So UDL is usually discussed among, along with accessibility and online course design because breaking down barriers and providing multiple forms of engagement, action expression, and representation includes making all of our stuff ADA compliant, accessibility 
the American Accessibility Act um, and uh, following the Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So um, these acts and the way we usually deal with them within higher education are a lot of times focusing in on these differently abled people and really focusing on physical accessibility and content accessibility. So this graph is from, um, or image is from uh, an article from, I think the University of Tennessee, their teaching and learning center are talking about the differences between accessibility and UDL. And um, ultimately um, it really shows you how you can move from like kind of like a just physical space of thinking about accessibility into moving into thinking about it as being more universal design for learning based in terms of being breaking down barriers for all and thinking about a little bit more holistically. So I'm gonna read a quick expert from, excerpt from it. So it's useful to consider that accessibility always has implied users and objects of accessibility. That is, when we speak of accessibility, we are discussing ensuring that certain individuals, users, have access to something object of accessibility. So, for example, if the goal is to provide learners with physical access to a classroom, regardless of their mobility needs, then accessibility focuses on removing physical barriers, such as narrow doorways and aisles, providing alternatives to stairways, etc. With content accessibility for learners with varying sensory abilities, barriers may be in the form of static materials, such as print textbooks, with solutions ranging from the employment of assistive technology or the use of digital materials like e-textbooks that are usually more accessible for diverse users. So that's usually where a lot of instructional designers and people in terms of course requirements, online learning requirements, website requirements stop when we talk about accessibility. So these examples show the most common conception of accessibility. In this view, accessibility is for people with disabilities and provides access to learning environments and content materials. So that one of the reasons we stop there is that that's the legal mandate. But overall, accessibility is typically a reactive design, reacting to our uh, differently abled patrons. And UDL uses a proactive design. And with this narrow perspective on accessibility, while critical, it only addresses the needs of a few. A foundational change begins when we design for accessibility that benefits everyone, not just students with disabilities. So UDL, Universal Design for Learning, extends the range of accessibility by designing for variability in general, rather than focusing on individuals, and by shifting the focus from external supports to internal skill development and expertise among the learners. So hopefully this kind of looking at them both can show how UDL pushes us further than the legal mandate, but it also helps us give us the tools to train our users to, have to take the same approach, which can be really applicable to open pedagogy um, and working with our content creators in this way. So now we're gonna talk about the connection between UDL and Open Educational Resources, OER. So a lot of y'all in that poll talked about practical things. Here are the big links that I usually talk about when I'm talking about like the nitty gritty of accessibility in terms of the legal mandate, which of course that is an integral part of creating universal design for learning experiences for our users. So learning management systems these days have built in accessibility checkers, including Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle. So be sure to talk to your um, instructional technologists, um, LMS administrators to talk through what you can do within there. For example, Canvas, that we, which we use at UNCG, uses you do it and other forms within there. Google has um, something called Grackle Docs or Grackle Slides if you're using Google Slides, which is an add-on, which takes you through how accessible your slides are, which can include alternative text, tables, and the hierarchy of headers. Um, PowerPoint also has a built-in tool that tells us that. Wave Web IM is a free accessibility checker on websites, which also includes libguides. Anything with a URL can be thrown into here, and it will show you the accessibility issues based on um, the standards, which uh, um, are um, listed in there, and they explain to you what's going on and how to fix it. So if you were interested in learning more about screen readers, you can do the NVDA or NV Access screen reader. And then Chrome has tons of extensions that can help you with accessibility, such as reading text with um, screen readers, color contrast, which is a huge thing with accessibility, and um, mobile checkers, because that's also a part of accessibility, making sure our content is accessible on mobile devices. Um, and they'll give you like how it looks on a mobile device um, versus how it looks on your computer screen. 
So how can librarians use UDL with OER initiatives? So um, now that we've kind of talked about the basics of UDL and OER in this short presentation, here's some specific examples. So we can create accessible materials, right? But going beyond that, we can use those UDL guidelines and really dig into the checkpoints that it's asking from us to make sure we're providing multiple means of representation, action expression, and engagement for our patrons um, with our workshops, with our tutorials, and more. So a lot of it can also be collaborating across institutions. Because of ADA compliance, most higher education, if not all higher education units, have an accessibility office. Um, most of us also have an office of teaching and learning where UDL workshops can work really well. Faculty um, really can connect to it because, again, it's about this breaking down barriers for our learners. And obviously, OER can be incorporated because OER is in breaking down barriers for our students. And we use this advocacy and language all the time. So we're, we have a nice place where we can fit in within UDL workshops as well. So and then just practically, right, with our training, we can use UDL when engaging with participants in OER training or workshops, whether we're working with our fellow librarians, instructors, or students. And then we can design courses and asynchronous learning objects, online learning objects, with UDL in mind. Again, I highly recommend using the UDL guidelines as a rubric or using those checkpoints to review your design process. Are you providing opportunities for engagement? Are you being accessible when you are creating engagement? And there are specific tools we can talk about that help, um, but really when you're looking at how you're engaging your students or your patrons or your faculty with OER um, programming or tutorials, you should be looking at um, interactive HTML5 um, thing, you know, resources that also list their accessibility guidelines very clearly. So here's some examples of how OER and UDL training have been combined from other universities. So again, this is a short presentation. I'm not going to click out into all of them, uh, but I recommend that y'all check it out. And I'll put the um, link to this uh, presentation back in the chat at the end if you came in late. So lastly, we're going to talk about the intersection between universal design for learning, open educational resources, and equity, diversity, and inclusion, also referred to as EDI. So a lot of you all are probably familiar with this, but Sarah Lambert's article from um, 2018 on changing our discourse, a distinctive social justice aligned definition of open education, um, where this paper investigates the degree to which recent digital open education literature is aligned to social justice principles. Um, so this link is here. If you haven't read this article, I highly recommend it. But in this article, she brings up this ideas, the social justice ideas of re redistributive justice, or cognitive justice, and representational justice. So most of our OER programs have this redistributive justice of saving students money, connecting to student success initiatives across campus, advocacy in this way. Where cognitive justice pushes it further, which examples given here are editable for visibility and recognition and creating inclusive language and images. So here's where accessibility can fit, creating accessible objects, but also pushing it further to have our online learning objects to be inclusive. Inclusive design goes further than UDL. It not only includes that everything is accessible, that it is UDL, it breaks down these barriers for our learners, but it's also inclusive in the language we use and the representation um, and more. And then the last one is representational justice, which is open pedagogy and opportunities for marginalized groups to tell their stories. And obviously here is where we can work with our students to give them the foundations of UDL as well, since we're asking them to be digital object creators. So here is the table presented in um, Lambert's article where the social justice principles are on the left and the alt text has, um, and the notes have the text for this table, which I'm sure it's a little bit hard to read depending on what device you're on. Um, and we probably, a lot of you might've seen this before, but just to show you here that this recognitive justice, which again, really includes this inclusive design goes further past creating ex accessible online learning objects. It's having socio-cultural diversity in open curriculum, inclusion of images, case studies, and knowledge of women, First Nations people, and whomever is marginalized in any particular national, regional, or learning context, recognition of diverse views and experiences as legitimate within open assignments and feedback. And then representational justice is constructing, again, these open pedagogy curriculums as well. And again, thinking through how we can include 
UDL within those, when that within that principle is crucial. So UDL does not ensure equity. That's really what I'm saying. Um, Lambert does a great job in her article of breaking down these social justice principles and giving practical examples that we can use in our OER advocacy. But really a big thing we can do is interlace or integrate our UDL practices with inclusive design. And if you want to learn more about this, I have a link here to a teaching and learning center from Harvard that goes over the basics and some specific examples of what you can do within your teaching and curriculums. And then another great article that I highly recommend is called Equitable But Not Diverse, Universal Design for Learning is Not Enough um, from In the Library of the Lead Pipe. It just came out a couple months ago. But in this, the authors survey students on representation within their online library research tutorials. And they find that their students, though that they're, you know, they use the UDL guidelines, they're totally accessible. They wanted better representation within the images and multimodal materials used within the tutorials. Um, so again, great article, great food for thought to kind of push us further even past UDL when we're creating online learning objects, doing workshops on OER. So this is a lot for a short period of time. Um, so this link takes you out to a bibliography of resources on UDL and library practice, including case studies on people using UDL when creating online learning objects, tutorials, flipping classroom in their instruction. There's also some articles on here of that, you know, academic articles on integrating OER and UDL within practices um, that you could check out. And that's it. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Um, if anybody's got any questions, we still have a few minutes left for the session. So feel free to either drop them in the chat or the question and answer option and we'll make sure that Sam can get them. And I am uh, dropping the link to the presentation again, because I know like with these short presentations, a lot's covered in a short amount of time. And there's tons of links out into here that go over, um, again, further reading, links to um, teaching and learning centers um, and more. So, um, and again, I am not the only one doing this work. Um, definitely check out the bibliography for more information. So um, yeah, I'll also upload these onto um, Puba. I think I'm saying that right. <laughs> um, I just, you know, probably like y'all, I was tinkering with the slides up until the presentation, so. And I apologize for my three-year-old. Um, I mean, my spouse uh, decided to go out, <laughs> even though I told, I told him there was a presentation. Great. And um, I also do research and work on inclusive design, though this was really more of a focus on universal design for learning. So if you have any questions or want me to send you um, more information beyond the link um, here that I provide to kind of get started with inclusive design, um, feel free to email me. My email is in the presentation. This has been great. I mean, lots of comments in the chat saying that as well. So thank you for being so informative and providing some great links. I look forward to taking the time to go through these in greater depth once this conference is over. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending today, and we will see you at another session. Thank you. I will go ahead and end the session now. Thank you. Thank you.